Hi, you're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine on New Channel TV. I'm Mariam Namazi, and I'm presenting this week's program with my fantastic co-host, Faribor Suya. Hi. In this week's program, we're going to be speaking about whether religious laws should ever be accommodated, not in places like Iran or Saudi Arabia, but in the West. Uh, obviously, it shouldn't be accommodated anywhere, but we're talking about parallel legal systems here in the West, and it's coming off the back of a victory against the Law Society, which recently backed down after having endorsed Sharia law in the issue of wills and estates. We have a speech by Pragna Patel, the director of Southall Black Sisters, at a recent conference we organized that discusses this very issue. And of course, as usual, we will have the insane fatwa of the week and also shocking news of this week. We hope you will enjoy this program. But before we go into the program, let's listen to a short background clip on the issue. Women's rights campaigners have welcomed the Law Society's withdrawal of their Sharia Wills practice note, which advised solicitors on how to draw up Sharia-compliant wills, stating that, quote, illegitimate and adopted children are not Sharia heirs. The male heirs in most cases receive double the amount inherited by a female heir. Non-Muslims may not inherit at all. A divorced spouse is no longer a Sharia heir. End of quote. After a campaign that included an open letter to Asma Jahangir, the former UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief, an open letter to the Law Society, a well-attended protest in April 2014 at the offices of the Law Society, and threat of legal action, the Law Society has withdrawn its note and apologized. Unbelievable, really, when you listen to that background clip about what the Law Society had given as matter-of-fact advice to solicitors. You know, laws that are so discriminatory, anti-women, talks about children who are illegitimate. I mean, those concepts don't even exist in the 21st century any longer. Using those concepts as a way of really discriminating against large groups of people in a sense, it is a form of racism rather than what is often, you know, um, uh, you know, oftentimes these sorts of laws are seen to be or presented as being tolerant and, you know, pro-minority rights. In fact, it's just pure and simple racism. Um, let's welcome the fact that law society has backed down. I Definitely. Think it's quite important and common sense has prevailed. prevailed. I think that's so important. Um, <laughs> And I think this is an um, indication that the campaign has worked, uh, but also um, the fact that the tide is turning. Um, we've had for many years that we've campaigned, yourself, Mariam, and many other um, social activists, uh, women right, women's rights activists have campaigned for equality of between men and women and the right to uh, be treated equally. Um, now, clearly, we can see that the tide is turning, uh, and this is one of the uh, areas that uh, the campaign has uh, succeeded, and we need to welcome that. And that's really congratulations to everybody who's taken part uh, in the campaign uh, National Secular Society, South Holbrook Sisters, uh, um, many other groups who actually uh, backed and, and supported this campaign. I mean, that, that's a very uh, sweet victory, I think, yes. Yeah, definitely. I mean, some of the groups that need to be mentioned is definitely Nari Diganta, um, and also, of course, South Hall Black Sisters, One Law for All, Ikrawa, which is the Iranian Kurdish Refugee Women's Organization, National Secular Society. And also LSC student groups who've been on forefront. Exactly, the Friday, LSC yeah. atheist group. So yeah. this has really been a campaign that seemed to be unwinnable. I think a lot of people felt that there's no way that the Law Society would back down. But they did back down, as did the universities UK when we opposed gender segregation at universities. And I think, as you say, the tide is turning. And what's becoming very clear now is that when we talk about these sort of laws, Sharia law, gender segregation, we're talking about Islamist values that are trying to be imposed on large numbers of people and not, you know, the demand and desire of Muslims per se. And I think 
in a, in a, in a speech that we're going to watch from Pragna Patel, she says very well that this is not about women choosing or people choosing these laws. They're not opting into them. What's happening is that the religious right, the Islamists, are opting people in. Uh, you know, point Absolutely. in blank. Um, um, about a couple of months ago, uh, immediately, I think after the conference, um, I went to um, um, a meeting in East London, um, in Whitechapel, um, and Pragna Patel was there as well, organised by Nari Diganti, the Bangladeshi Women's Association, and many other people who take, uh, took part in that meeting. You know, many women from the um, East London communities took part, and they were livid with the fact that uh, law society has um, sort of given advice note. And the only people who opposed that meeting were the Islamists who threatened to disrupt the meeting because they didn't want this uh, uh, meeting to go ahead. And that meeting clearly condemned, from the heart of East London, condemned the Sharia law, Sharia court, the uh, law society's uh, practice note. And, this, and I think that was critical to show sure everybody recognizes now that, uh, as you said, uh, Sharia uh, law, it's the campaign of the Islamists uh, in Britain and needs to be seen as such. It's nothing to do with the uh, uh, communities that uh, are the reason they yeah. uh, they want secular law and they want equality between men and women. And, and in fact, what it's doing is it, it's discriminating against people who deserve equal rights and citizenship rights. Let's now go and listen to a fantastic speech by Pragna Patel, the director of South Hall Black Sisters. She explains you know, the problems with this sort of accommodating parallel legal systems and religious law um, and, and why it's so bad for, for people, religious or not. Stay with us. Pragna Patel, who I think most of you know anyway, so we'll get straight on with Pragna's uh, presentation. Um, so anyway, so it's an absolute pleasure, honor, and, uh, and privilege to be here, uh, particularly in, the comp in, in such august company. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the situation in the UK in respect of religion, state, and the law. Um, and I've obviously, I can only talk about or, or confidently talk about my experiences in South or Black Sisters. Um, the first thing I want to say uh, when I reflect back on our work in the last five years, perhaps a decade or so, is that in the UK, uh, we at South or Black Sisters have become increasingly preoccupied with just one key question above all else, how to access justice on behalf of the most vulnerable. Um, and of course, access to justice has always been a central concern, given that we have long recognized the legal arena as a key site of feminist resistance. Um, we've used the law in a variety of ways to ensure that the most marginalized and vulnerable women that we work with can exercise their right to equality, to justice, to fairness in civil and criminal proceedings. And this has involved laying bare class, race, and gender norms in the law itself that reproduce inequality and legitimate exclusionary and discriminatory outcomes for minority women. The struggle to hold the law to account in that sense remains unfinished business, even though we have, together with others, made some significant gains along the way. But I think the struggle to access justice has now reached crisis point. The ever-widening shadow of neoliberalism and the rise and rise of fundamentalist religious identity politics has left us struggling on two interlinked fronts. First, we're absolutely compelled to challenge the state for removing legal aid from huge range of civil and criminal matters, which not only impact on individual rights, but also on our demands for institutional accountability in the face of abuses of power, which are actually growing and not diminishing. The government's so-called reforms on legal aid 
are strongly located in a fiscal context that reiterates some of the key overarching aims of the present government. Localism, alternative dispute resolution strategies, deficit reduction and deregulation. Taken to make together, these measures are destroying one of the great pillars of the welfare state. They have forced us into leading or supporting legal and political challenges against legal aid cuts. But this development is significant for another reason. It's directly linked to the challenges we face on the second front, which is the increasing privatization of justice and state adoption of faith-based approach to address legal issues in minority communities. This has meant, amongst other things, challenging religious fundamentalism and moderates alike, who seek to influence the law and social policy by reference to a regressive religious identity that they have come to define. So in the last few years in the UK, we've seen the rise in demand for the accommodation of religious legal codes in the very fabric of the legal system. Demands which parts of the state have, uh, um, have been only too happy to accommodate. These demands emanate from powerful Muslim spokespersons and institutions and can be directly linked to the growth of political Islam and more generally to the rise of fundamentalism in all religions. Muslim fundamentalists have, have mounted what I describe as a two-pronged pincer-like maneuver based on st ostensibly on the demand for religious tolerance but which is in reality a bid for power at the heart of which lies the control of female sexuality. On the one hand, they seek to ensure that personal religious codes are normalized within the legal system itself, and on the other, to formalize a parallel legal system through the establishment of alternative religious forums for dispute resolution, particularly in family matters. And this process, I refer to as a shariafication by stealth of the legal apparatus involves making state law and policy sharia compliant. And if it's successful, we have no doubt that it would lead other religions to demand the same level of accommodation. As secular black feminists, so what we have to contend with today echoes previous struggles that challenge multiculturalism and the left-leaning variant anti-racism. Whereas previously we challenged the anti-racist movement and official multiculturalism for abstracting notions of culture and for failing to deal with gender power relations, we now find ourselves challenging official multi-faithism, which has formalized communal identities and parts of the anti-racist and feminist movement itself, frankly, for abstract, abstracting notions of religion. To, and so let me give you some examples of what I mean by the shariafication by stealth of, so, of law and policy. First example, I'm sure these examples are well known to, to most of you. The end of 2012, against the growing practice of gender segregation at public events and universities, public, yes, um, um, events in universities, the Universities UK, which is the governing body of British universities, issued guidance which permitted gender segregation of women in university spaces in order to accommodate the religious be beliefs of external speakers. The guidance presented in the form of a case study purported to provide advice in context where the right to manifest religion clashes with gender equality. Far from addressing the question of what was frankly sex discrimination, the guidance merely legitimized gender apartheid. It took a campaign and threats of legal action before the UUK agreed to withdraw the guidance. And we argued that the UUK's guidance violated equality and non-discrimination principles enshrined, for example, in the public sector equality duty and other equalities and human rights legislations, which themselves are the product of long and hard campaigns by feminists, racial minorities, and other marginalized groups in society. Um, learning nothing from that debacle, 
The Law Society, my second example, a body that represents the interests of the legal profession, followed the UUK by issuing guidance to lawyers on how to prepare Sharia compliant wills. And it was actually drafted, if you look carefully, with reference to Islamists who defend death by stoning, amongst other things, and, who, and the guidance endorsed so-called Sharia succession rules, which stipulate that as a general rule, a male heir will inherit twice the amount that a female heir will receive, and illegitimate children are not heirs. Apart from other discriminatory bits, that's the bit um, that really stands out. Clearly, the guidance accepts without question the inherent discrimination that exists in Islam and indeed in other religions um, against women and against children born outside marriage. Quite apart from the fact that the law society cannot possibly know what is and isn't Sharia law, given that Muslim religious codes are varied and actually vigorously contested as well as targeted for repeal throughout the world, the real problem, and this is the shocking part of it, is that the law society sees no wrong into wading into doctoral doctrinal territory. And much to our dismay, the guidance is part of a wider program of training courses developed by the Law Society to encourage Sharia compliance to the question of family, children, property, and financial settlements in minority communities. What we see operating actually is an inverse form of racism. Because far from promoting a rights compliant culture, the Law Society is helping to arrest the development of a secular human rights culture from taking root in minority communities. And it's giving succor to Islamist demands for religious and secular laws to operate in parallel universes. So our struggle for the right to access a secular human rights framework is difficult. But it is made that much more difficult in a context where the government has also consistently invoked the need to uphold so-called British values, presumably meaning respect for human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, even though in the same breath, it also threatens to repeat the Human Rights Act, especially every time a court seeks to assert the universal application of human rights in cases of state abuse of power. My third example, I have one minute, is of course, um, uh, in, in terms of concerns about the growing alignment of religion and the law, is state support for non-state religious arbitration systems. By removing legal aid, actually the state has forced minority women to resort to formal and informal religious authority and forums such as Sharia councils and tribunals, which appear to be on the increase. But what they're in fact seeking to do is to exclude the application of what is considered to be Western secular law, especially in family matters, and to establish instead a parallel legal system based on divine law, which by its very nature is immune from regulation and scrutiny. What's, what's alarming is that support for, separate, uh, for parallel legal systems come not only from male religious leaderships and from the state, but actually from parts of feminism itself and the left. And um, yet few of those feminists who support this acknowledge the fact that wherever parallel legal systems operate, they generally suppress dissent and seek to remove women from public spaces, metaphorically speaking, and to impede their fundamental freedoms in the private sphere. And they also do not acknowledge that there are substantial movements led by women and human rights activists for the repeal of state-sanctioned religious orders. Instead, notions of autonomy and female agency, the cornerstone of feminist analysis, are actually invoked to shore up a regressive multi-faith framework. I don't have time to go into a, a South or Black Sisters study we did um, looking at women's use of Sharia councils and tribunals, except to say that um, many did not, uh, far from accessing these forums voluntarily, um, uh, um, exercise a highly constrained agency in contexts where the stranglehold of religion left them little room for maneuver. So I suppose what I should say, um, um, just as concluding comments, that advocates for parallel legal systems 
argue that having recourse to religious forums does not mean that white minority women are seeking to opt out of the wider political community. Um, they argue that, that all they're seeking is the right to be governed by their own norms. But I think this position misses the point that women are choosing not to opt out at all. They are being opted out by the religious right and by the state. They're actually denied the tools they need to withstand pressures to conform to custom or to invo invoke a broader set of citizenship and human rights. And by doing so, they're denied the right to participate in the wider political community as citizens rather than as subjects. So what we see at work then is clearly an attempt to impede the development of secular, progressive political resistance by delegitimizing and locating our struggles for access to justice outside of so-called community anti-racist and feminist concerns. So our struggle actually is taking place on many fronts as both religious forces and the state amount an assault on secular human rights values in pursuit of power without accountability. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that interview with uh, Pragna Patel. Uh, you know why South Hall Black Sisters' slogan is uh, tra our tradition, struggle, not submission. And I think that's exactly the slogan of so many women's rights campaigners and secularist campaigners who fought against the law society's rules. I think, you know, it's a huge victory, particularly since what we're seeing is if the law society had succeeded in maintaining these guidelines, it would have been a further institutionalization of Sharia law. And that's something that, you know, it would just make it even worse, in a sense, for, for people. Yeah. I think the important thing is that to recognize that the Sharia law and Sharia campaign is the ISIS um, and Islamist uh, demand. Uh, and the next step is for the Sharia courts to be banned and religious courts to be banned. I think that's so important, and that makes Britain. If if that take if that happens, that gives a brilliant signal to everybody across the world that people who are fighting for equality that there is hope. In the same way that people who stood up against uh, ISIS in Kobani, and they are defeating it, that we need to defeat sh Sharia courts in Britain as well. That's the next target, and we need to succeed there as well. Definitely. I mean, when you think about it, the tide is really turning. We succeeded in stopping Universities UK from endorsing gender apartheid, sex segregation at universities in Britain. It has now been deemed illegal by the Equalities uh, Commission. We have now forced, in a sense, the Law Society to back down and to apologize for endorsing Sharia compliant wills. Um, and the next step is Sharia courts, in a sense. Britain is hugely important in the fight against Islamism because it is a stronghold of the Islamist movement. So I think we should all take courage that this has happened and f carry on, move on from this victory on to further victories. So hugely important for citizens in this country, but people everywhere. Uh, now let's go to the shocking news of the week. In shocking news of this week, we have news that the UN's Human Rights Committee has finally stated that 
a child marriage until the age of 18 should be completely banned and there is no legitimate reason even cultural or otherwise to allow for it and of course who's opposed to this Iran and Sudan why they're on the Human Rights Commission in the first place is shocking news in and of itself uh, but this now has passed and will be sent on to the General Assembly. So it's shocking news, but it's also good news to some I think extent. I, I think that, that's very good uh, because it's going to send the shock, shock waves through the Islamist uh, world. In the same way that the Declaration of Equality of Men and Women in Kobani, which we declared that's very important. These are, these are, as, you know, these are important uh, developments that are taking place. Uh, people are, in the world cannot accept inequality and they cannot accept religious law uh, um, undermining the uh, development of children and I think that's very important and such a good news. I Definitely think. and I think one of the things is too that we wouldn't have these developments was there not this huge grassroots movement and opposition to child marriages. I mean this has taken decades of work for it to reach the level of the UN and again that's really I think a victory for campaigners everywhere. Now let's go to the insane fatwa of the week. Now, one example of a shocking fatwa is one that was issued by some clerics in northern Nigeria. The clerics basically said that the free polio vaccinations that children were receiving were actually attempts at sterilizing the children and preventing true believers from, from growing up in Nigeria. And what's happened is, as a result of this fatwa, there have been many more cases of polio in that area. And and children's rights campaigners have been fighting against this tide. And it just goes to show that fatwas don't just affect atheists and ex-Muslims and people who have transgressed religious norms, but it even stands against, you know, basic vaccination of children. Yeah, I think that reminds me of uh, the position that Catholic Church had on use of contraceptives in, in Africa when the issue of AIDS was around. Religion kills simply religion kills and that's really insane religion you know there need to be a, a label on any religion that religion kills in the same way that we have a label on cigarettes thank you for that Faribors I wonder what you all think about these issues that we've raised do contact us we love to hear from you and we hope that you have a fantastic week until we see you next week bye <laughs>